Hi everyone, welcome back to Lecture 9J of Useful Genetics, where we're going to begin talking about hybrids. I'll first introduce the main issues, kinds of hybrids, and issues of viability and fertility, and then we'll talk about within-species hybrids, particularly their importance in plant breeding. So here's a diagram of different kinds of species that we're going to discuss over the next few lectures. And the particular issues that we'll address for each kind of kind of hybrid. So first, for hybrids between members of the same species, and in particular, we'll be talking about inbred strains of the same species, often their viability is not just as good as the parents, it's actually better than the parents, and we'll discuss that in this lecture. And their fertility can also be higher than their inbred strain parents. Now, when we consider hybridization at the level of speciation, what we're looking at is individuals from two populations that maybe are on their way to becoming different species. And under these circumstances, typically, the viability of the hybrids may be as high as the parents, maybe a bit less, and the same for fertility. Between close species, um, hybrids are not always viable. When they are, these are species that often humans have exploited. Um, so sometimes they're viable, sometimes they're not. When they're viable, though, they're not fertile. Um, fertility is very rare be in hybrids between members of different species. And between diff distinct sp distant species, between distant species, typically viability is, there's no viability. Um, rarely there may be fertilization, but developmental incompatibilities are usually strong enough that the embryo will simply abort. Um, and of course, then, there's no issue of fertility. Now, to consider hybrids within the same species, these are called intraspecific hybrids. And they're common in plant and animal breeding. Um, in some ways, the mouse experiment that I described in the last slide, the clever one with all the colored recombinant chromosomes, was an example of forming intraspecific hybrids between different inbred mouse strains. The main example we're going to talk about here, though, is plant hybrids. And the best example is hybrid corn. Um, to you non-Americans, that's hybrid maize. And here is a photograph of three varieties of corn. On the left and on the right are two inbred strains. These are strains that have been developed by plant breeders to be, you know, good yielding, reliable strains of corn that breed true. And in the middle is a plant that's a hybrid made by pollinating one of these strains with pollen from the other strain. And you can see that the hybrid grows much bigger, is much more vigorous than either of its parents. And in some ways, we can think of the effects of forming a hybrid between two inbred strains as reversing the effects of the hybrid um, inbreeding depression that occurred when the inbred strains were formed. And I think the next slide describes the properties of the hybrids. So as we said, they have high vigor, often called hybrid vigor. A technical term is heterosis. But that, I always think that sounds like some kind of disease. Um, and the reason for the high vigor is that harmful recessive alleles have been complemented. Now, remember that the inbred strains that are crossed must have been independently inbred. They're not just two isolates of the same strain. And when they were independent, you'll remember that when inbred strains are formed, often mildly deleterious alleles are fixed fixed in the sense that they become established in the population as the only allele that's present. And so independent inbred strains typically have different 
slightly defective alleles that are homozygous in them. So that when they're crossed, the hybrid plant is heterozygous at all of the loci where the parents were homozygous. And any harmful recessive alleles are complemented, just like in the complementation test. They often show normal or better than normal fertility and seed production. This is especially important when the crop's product is in fact seed, as is in the case with corn. And they're also genetically and phenotypically uniform. Remember we talked in the previous lecture about the importance of uniformity for commercial um, crops, that the breeders want to sell something where all the seeds are going to grow the same. And that is true of the hybrid corn that's formed by crossing two inbred strains. And there's one more bonus, which is it only takes one generation to get all of these properties. It's not like conventional breeding where you have generation after gen. Remember that 25 generation plant pedigree? This is one generation and you get all of these benefits. So how does it work? Well, one way to think of it is it's kind of like Mendel's F1. He called it an F1 hybrid generation. He crossed two parents that we now know were homozygous for the alleles that he was interested in. In fact, they were probably homozygous at lots of alleles because these were commercial strains of peas that plant breeders were selling. If we were to draw the mating square for the F1 generation, for, um, well, for any F1 cross, really, it's only got one square in it. Remember, with Mendel's plants, the gametes were all, you know, big Y or little y, and the offspring, the F1, was big Y, little y. So the offspring were heterozygous for any alleles that differed between the two homozygous parents. In the case of um, hybrid inbred strains generally, the genotype may be much more complex. You could think of it as A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, etc., Y, Z. And the same here, the gamete. The gamete might be little a, big B, big C, little D, little E, little F, big G, etc. But there's still, each parent is only producing one type of gamete because they're inbred. And so the um, offspring are all identically heterozygous for the alleles that distinguish the two parents. Now, so we talked about the um, benefits of interspecific hybrids, but there's one downside. It's a big one. And that is, it only takes one generation to create all these benefits, but the benefits only last one generation. And that's because hybrids do not breed true. When the hybrid corn produces its own seeds, those seeds are not going to have the same genotype that the parent plant had. And again, that makes sense if we think of it as being like Mendel's F2 generation. So in, remember, if we think about our diagram of the F1, now if we draw the F2, and we're thinking about the same, now the gametes from the F1 are big Y and little y, big Y and little y, and we get different combinations in the F2 progeny. If, of course, we had we're considering one of Mendel's crosses where he was tracking differences at two unlinked genes. Now there are four types of gametes. And 16 different combinations. Some of them are identical, but still there's a lot of different genotypes are going to be produced. If there were three genes at which the two homozygous inbred parents differed, this is what the, grid, the mating square would look like. And if there was four, it would look like this, with 64 different combinations to consider. Natural um, inbred 
strains of plants are going to differ at a lot more than four loci. So the offspring, the F2 offspring, obtained by crossing the hybrids with themselves, are going to be wildly variable and completely unsuitable as crop plants. So we've introduced different kinds of hybridization and the different kinds of consequences. And then we thought in detail about the consequences for within-species hybrids, of which the most dramatic consequence is the phenomenon of hybrid vigor talked about why we see hybrid vigor with an analogy to Mendel's first cross producing his F1 generation. And then we talked about why hybrid vigor only lasts one generation and decays into a very population with very mixed phenotypes with a nice analogy to Mendel's F2 generation. Coming up next, we're going to talk about between species hybrids. The photo shows an example of mules at the Grand Canyon. I hope to see you there.